Hello, and welcome to Learning from Nature, the biomimicry podcast with me, your host, Lily Ehrman. I'm so happy you're here. The beautiful and brilliant natural world is an endless source of inspiration. And in this podcast, I aim to explore what we can learn from life around us, share how this field is being practiced globally, and equip you all with the tools necessary to tap into nature's genius. Today, I sit down with Dr. Laura Lee Stevens to talk about the journey of learning about and teaching biomimicry, our connection to nature, and so much more. I will also share some insight into the different education programs out there. Let's jump right in. Dr. Laura Stevens holds two Master's of Science degrees in the field of architecture from Delft University of Technology and biomimicry from Arizona State University. She is a biomimicry design educator in her role as a professor in the Industrial Design Engineering Program at the Hague University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. A sustainable design instructor since 2007, she completed her PhD in Delft, where she wrote a series of peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on the topic of biomimicry design thinking as a methodology to enhance circular systems thinking solutions in design by learning from time-tested biological strategies and mechanisms found in nature. So welcome, Dr. Laura Stevens. I will jump right in with um, having you kind of introduce yourself and please include your pronouns. I'm Laura Stevens. I guess she, her. Um... I uh, fell in love with biomimicry, I think, when I was a kid. Uh, yeah, growing up as a um, campfire girl in America <laughs> and going to summer camp and camping out and uh, learning about nature and earning my beads. And instead of earning my, my patches, I earned my beads in, uh, girl, in campfire girls. And... Yeah, you know, I just loved going outside and uh, loved climbing, climbing waterfalls and swimming and kayaking, canoeing, you know, all those outdoor stuff. And it just seemed to all to make sense when I got into design and as an architect later and then loving nature. You know, how do you combine the things yeah. and loving teaching? So combining, it became my uh, sweet spot, actually. That's awesome. Yeah, I totally agree. Falling in love with the natural world led me in this direction. My first question for you, um, I'm just going to start off with kind of a basic question of how would you describe biomimicry? How I would describe it? I think biomimicry for me is the awesome eye-opening of what nature really has to offer us it, to, to teach us and mm -hmm. not just what I can learn from it, but it's just really so cool that you can learn how hard the manta shrimp can hit and how, how um, glass sponges can just build out of the min minerals right around them and in, in ambient temperatures. It's just it's so amazing. Every time you think about what is what all the organisms in nature are actually mm -hmm. doing it just uh yeah you can uh, go crazy uh, loving it falling in love again every time again yes i totally agree and that is um kind of a good follow up question what made you fall in love with the practice of biomimicry and how did you get kind of interested in the field and and now becoming a practitioner of biomimicry <laughs> That's a really nice question. You know, I I will never forget Dr. Dana Bymoster's words when she said, well, I hope we infect you with this virus. <laughs> and it's so relevant right now. The biomimicry virus is, uh, you know, of course I had read Janine Benyus' book, um, mm -hmm. Innovation in Nature. So, you know, I I really had heard of it and and was interested but it wasn't until i went to this immersion workshop in oracle in arizona that i understood you know how how powerful it all was and so i i fell in love with the the idea i have these tools and i can teach these tools to my students and it can give them the tools to really make a difference in the world. And that, I think that's how I fell in love with the, the practice, because I saw how much power it had, actually, and, and good power to do good. Yeah, I totally agree. 
um, especially being newer in the education space, just seeing the impact it has on other people and introducing them to that, um, this practice, which is endlessly inspiring. I totally agree. Yeah. Um, so in that vein, what has been your like biomimicry journey? Um, I feel like I get a lot of questions um, in this space around where can they go for resources or what programs are out there? Um, and you you just received your doctorate. And so I'm excited to hear hmm. kind of your biomimicry education journey um, all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I think, like I said, uh, starting as a campfire girl and growing up in the um, the Berkshires in uh, Massachusetts as a kid. Uh, I think that was the, the first part of my education journey, just learning outside. And then uh, I think starting going to the immersion workshop in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And Dana mentioned, oh, you know, you can, you can join uh, Arizona State University and uh, learn about biomimicry there. And so I started to look it up and I, you know, I already had a master's in architecture, so I wasn't really uh, looking for another master's, but then <laughs> I thought, okay, how can I do this? How can I do this? And a colleague of mine had already started her PhD and, and she said, well, why don't you do a PhD in, in a biomimicry education? I said, well, you know, I never really, I'm more a, a hands-on like do person. So mm -hmm. I never really had thought about that. And then she said, but yeah, but you can write in uh, an educational uh, passage in your proposal saying this, you know, you need some pocket money <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to learn it. Because, I, of course, I saw the, the, that it costs money and I, I have a job and I work uh, at the Hague University of Applied Sciences. But still, it does cost quite a bit of money to, to do next to your uh, next to the other things that you do yeah. in life. So, no, the, but the, the more you think about it, the more and the more you, you look into what Arizona State University had to offer. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm just going to try. We'll see how far I go. Maybe I don't reach the whole master's. And then I took the first course. <laughs> 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 and, you know, just just learning about the essentials of biomimicry. And I'm like, no, this is it. This is it. Yeah. This, is, this is exactly what I needed and exactly what fit in, I think, the gap that I had. Because, you know, I, being an architect, I, you know, I wasn't designing anymore. I was more teaching. And I was teaching in the industrial design engineering program. But I didn't have my niche. My niche, I could, anytime a student did something outdoors, because I'm also an, uh, a landscape architect, mm -hmm. uh, I could I could focus on that. But I didn't have, uh, I think what they call uh, like a really important niche that, okay, that's what Laura is known for. Yeah. And I, I wanted to offer something. And when I learned all these things about the essentials of biomimicry and how just going outside, you, that, as easy as going outside in your backyard and looking at how things grow and the patterns and the systems around you, then I thought, well, this is this is just, I was hooked. Yeah. So uh, from one class led to the next one, led to the next. And before I knew it, uh, you know, I was... I was teaching the same things that I learned there to my students at the mm -hmm. Hague University and seeing their eyes just sparkle yeah. is I think because you're also a teacher, you know, you you have the same experience that you see the awe in their eyes. And you know, so that just, just that gave me so much power to to do the second masters, to do the PhD, to mm -hmm. do the research on the students. And uh, prove, I guess, <laughs> prove how how powerful uh, biomimicry is as a tool for learning, whatever you're learning, because like, you can approach any kind of challenge with biomimicry. So for any kind of learning, any kind of um, even just an inspiring workshop or or learning the deep patterns, or um, how can you make changes happen, or how can you look at look at the whole ecosystem of your product or or your neighborhood, yeah, yep. and how you can where can you intervene, where can you make a difference? You can use biomimicry for 
I think for everything, if you ask the right question. Yeah. And, and what you mentioned about joining the master's program and becoming instantly hooked, I feel like that is <laughs> why it's so applicable to everybody because they see how they can then bring that practice into their own field and career and life. And it's just a yeah. game changer. And that's kind of like how I fell in love with it too. It was, um, you know, a little bit of a frustration with the world and feeling like I couldn't make much of a difference or it was just such a big problem, um, especially being in the environmental sciences field. And then first hearing about it and hearing about the student team um, that was working on this biomimicry project, this kind of the the light bulb went off, so to speak. And I was like, oh, (laughs) all of the solutions that we need for our survival, even facing an immense, you know, climate chaos um, challenge already exist in the natural world. And we can look to nature for those solutions. And that was a game changer, that like kind of hopeful and deeply humbling (laughs) perspective. Exactly. Um, Yeah. And that master's program was really wonderful. I'd love to talk a little bit more about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Just because I think so many folks are interested in pursuing biomimicry and there's so much out there right now for biomimicry, um, different programs and levels of programs. So if you want to do a full master's there, there's that master's at Arizona state university, but there's also a ton of workshops out there and just kind of one-off classes. And I said, there's a lot of um, opportunities out there. There's definitely not as many as other programs. And I think that biomimicry is still an emerging field. It's been described and yeah. as, as an emerging field recently. Um, and I think it's definitely still emerging. Um, that being said, oh, however, definitely. I've been seeing more and more education out there for it, which is really awesome. And I think just having some sort of conversation around what's out there as far as our experiences go. I love the master's program. Honestly, I was hesitant at first thinking, oh, it's online. Like, how can I practice biomimicry online? Right. Um, But then starting the program and realizing that it was really built and designed in a way that is for a global community. And for you to take that information, do that research in your own ecosystem, and then come back and do the group work and the projects and the collaboration with people from all over the world. Um, It was incredibly, uh, it was built really well and I loved it. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience in that program and what you thought of it, um, especially as others are thinking of potentially um, doing a program like that, or maybe even an informal program, like learn biomimicry, um, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, like uh, in South Africa. That's also a really, really wonderful program. Um, You know, as long as you keep true to yourself and you stay open to all there is to learn with biomimicry. I think you're in the, going in the right direction. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's also uh, valuable to just be learning a little bit, but it the more you learn, the more you know that you don't know yet. Okay, a little about the different biomimicry programs, both formal and informal. There are a couple of undergraduate certificates offered by Arizona State University and Akron University, where students have a major but focus on biomimicry. There's only one master's that is focused entirely on the biomimicry methodology, which is an online program also from ASU. Akron has a fellowship in biomimicry that is paired with a doctorate program. You can also find biomimicry-related courses taught by faculty in a variety of departments across the world. Some of the ones I'm familiar with are at Pratt Institute, my class, UC Berkeley, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and Rhode Island School of Design. As far as non-academic and informal programs go, there are many to explore. Biomimicry 3.8 offers a biomimicry professional training that includes immersion programs around the world and is paired with the ASU master's program, which requires a significant time and financial investment. Biomimicry Frontiers offers a few different courses, ranging from a shorter self-paced online course to a cohort-based coaching program where participants are challenged to shift their perspective, learn about biomimicry, and apply the practice to their careers, projects, and life. Similarly, Learn Biomimicry has a suite of online introductory courses and a practitioner's program. If you're wanting just one workshop, there are plenty of speaker series, outdoor walks with biomimics, and one-off events with folks in the field happening everywhere. Just research some local biomimicry groups near you or groups that might be related to biomimicry. And so, and so you, if you get that hooked feeling, then you'll want to learn how to uh, apply 
life's principles and and why these are so these these overarching patterns are so so important and just to us as people as yeah. part of this ecosystem on this planet how important they are to understand and to share with others just in your everyday speaking because using life's principles like such as cultivate cooperative relationships now it sounds so yeah normal of course mm -hmm. you cultivate cooperative relationships but if you really start to ask yourself how and why and and then you you integrate that in as a requirement in anything mm -hmm. you're doing then you start to understand other people around you side note and a little about life's principles these are a collection of 26 deep patterns identified and described in nature that represent everything life has to do in order to survive on Earth. Some principles besides cultivating cooperative relationships include adapt to changing conditions, use life-friendly chemistry, and evolve to survive. These principles are widely used in the practice of biomimicry and are a measure of how life-friendly a design is. However, with our current systems, it's really difficult to include a lot of life's principles. But as we understand them more and design disruptive technologies, we can work towards integrating them more fully. It's not just for one particular design. It's for life mm -hmm. in general. And that's why if you learn life's principles in a deep manner, again and again, you iterate your learning on them, you understand how widely they can be used. And that, that also goes for the translation part, from the translation from the biology to the design part. Mm -hmm. the, the deeper you dive into that, the more you understand how to abstract those design principles and apply them and and make them more and more understandable for others because that was yeah one of the one of the tricky parts i know other people like aaron ravolo has written about that earlier uh that that was one of the trickiest parts of mm -hmm. biomimicry and you know you don't want people to get afraid of it so if you can make it really easy to understand and even if it's just metaphorically speaking the first time, mm -hmm. the next time it might be more literal and you might be able to change the scale and look at it differently. So it, it's it's about, I think, it, now, now we're, that we're talking about it, I think it's a lot about the iteration of all those tools that yeah, we use in biomimicry. Exactly. And not just one class on life's principles, but you integrate them into each of the semesters and not just one class on the translation, but you have to do that a few times to really get used to it, get practiced in the field. Yeah. And then, and then share that, yeah. <laughs> how to do that. And Laura, you um, wrote and, and did some research into the impact of biomimicry education in that space that I'd love to hear some more about your project and your, your doctorate. Oh, okay. Love to talk about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the, it, it seems also so simple, but one of the things that I uh, found is that the more that you, um, the more that the students discover themselves and the more that they are able to draw the, the biology, even if it's just stick figures, what what's happening there or, or, um, what can you do with this function? The You can use it for pretty much any kind of class, in any kind of education, mm -hmm. and enrich the class. So educationally, it's a really wonderful t tool to help students learn yeah. and learning anything. So so that's on one side. You can implement it in, in different disciplines in different ways by um, just having students go outside and observe and and ask them what they're seeing. Because people, you know, indigenous people have, they, they know how to see the world about them, but the rest of us have kind of forgotten that, that practice. Yeah. So we need to relearn a lot of that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of knowledge and uh, and be able to recognize it when it's there, yeah. recognize the signs around us. And I think educationally, when when students are learning and they're happy to learn, that's a, a curious thing. I don't know if you uh, read what I had written, but 
the students, they, I asked my students to do three nature technology summaries. Yeah, yeah. And those take about 20 hours to do. And a nature technology summary is when you're looking for a particular function and you find this in different organisms. So each nature technology summary will look at one organism and one particular function and 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 look at the strategy, how what's happening there and how is it happening and looking deeper into that specific mechanism mm -hmm. that makes it work. So these summaries, they take 20 hours. I can't grade them for that because it's not part of our uh, industrial design engineering program, but the students did them. And mm -hmm. I just asked them and they did them. And so what teacher wouldn't want their students to voluntarily do more research <laughs> and, and be excited to learn about more? It. And be excited about it. And, you know, I asked them in surveys because I would do also weekly surveys. I said, what was the most difficult? What was easy? Now, these uh, nature technology summaries with the abstracted design principles were the most difficult, but also the most rewarding. And, you know, if you get if you get them hooked like I am, like you are, like other biomimics are, and they want to keep learning, that I think that is the most valuable skill a person a human being can mm -hmm. can receive is that yearn to learn yeah i love that and especially in an education system that has for so long prioritized test taking and memorization oh and ooh, yep. when you spend so many of your years and i'm speaking mostly from the american standpoint in the us here we our system is very very test focused um, especially for the first 12 years and moving into a space where you are asked to be curious and explore what interests you and then research that was such a game changer. And I got so much more excited about education and teaching in this space because exactly. to see that reaction in students and see them be excited about being curious. And that's kind of a huge point in a lot of the workshops and classes I teach is this cultivating curiosity. And I love that yeah. you said you're in to learn. I think that's equally, equally as valid. Yeah. And no, you're and, absolutely yeah. right, Lily. Yeah. It's just such a game changer. And I think along this note too, one of my big questions for you was why is biomimicry education important? And I think we touched on that a little bit, but especially in the world we live today, I'm curious what your thoughts on are about why why teaching biomimicry and introducing the students to biomimicry is so important now. Well, that it is definitely so important. I can tell you why, because the more the students learn about different organisms and about different ecosystems and different processes that that occur on the world, the more they understand them, the more they learn to love them, mm -hmm. the more they adopt them, the more they want to protect them. Yeah. So it's, it's also a, a, an important way to get to where we need to go. We need to make bigger changes than we've been making mm -hmm. <laughs> lately. So, you know, if I think if uh, every street, <laughs> had a biomimic on it, then, you know, we would be going much faster in the right direction, simply because more people would be aware that they do have some kind of way to make differences. And it may seem small, small but a lot of little smalls is a huge mm -hmm. difference when you put them all together. So that's why this kind of education, um, and, and I can sum it up in the big five of education that um, Naturalis, that's a biodiversity center here in the Netherlands. They have the big five of education. And that would be that it should be real when anything that the students are working on, it should be a real challenge. It should be a relevant challenge. And it should also be awe-inspiring. You know, and I think biomimicry helps that awe-inspiring mm -hmm aspect just by simply learning about what the, the different organisms can do. Um, and then it, it should require some scientific research. And that's what biomimicry does. And it, it requires science. And we have to dive in. As biomimics, we dive into the scientific journal articles. 
to find out what the biologists have spent a lifetime to learn. Mm -hmm. And and we get to crystallize those pearls that they have um, you know, created mm -hmm. for us to help us learn. And that's that's a wonderful thing to be, you know, I'm a, I'm a biologist wannabe. So I, I didn't go into that field in the beginning, but I've, it's always kind of been in the back of my head. And I, yeah. I started in with zoology and I wanted to be a vet, but being a veterinarian also means you have to take the, take the animals apart. And I couldn't yeah. do that. So, so I, I, I couldn't go in that direction, no matter much how, how I wanted to save the animal uh, kingdom. Yeah. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't do that. So it, it, it's it, it's important to hit on all of those five aspects: the, the science, the the research, the uh, relevancy, the real and actual problems, mm -hmm. and to have it all be what, what your tools be awe inspiring, you know. And that is that fits biomimicry perfectly. It does. So this is it, this is uh, I live in a village that's right outside of Leiden in the Netherlands, and that. Uh, I, I love to go to this museum each time I teach the biomimicry thinking semester and, and we can go and observe the natural world <laughs> in a, in a wonderful way. And they're, they're, they're a wonderful um, place to learn about yeah. and practice biomimicry or to learn about biomimicry. They even have some different tables that you can do uh, observations and drawing. We call them eyesights in, in biomimicry, but, that's also learning to see and learning to observe. Yeah, I love that. And this, this so that's why it's so important. <laughs> yeah, it's so important. And the relevancy really speaks to me too. When I introduce students from every discipline, well, I was working at ASU to create an undergraduate program, and we had students from over 15 different majors, you know, from business um, to architecture and design to sustainability and everywhere in between. And they all became instantly hooked on biomimicry because they could see how it related to their career and how they could then integrate a lot of these deep practices and principles, like you mentioned, um, into their field um, for a future that would be, um, you know, more sustainable and regenerative for everybody, not just humans, but our non-human neighbors. Too. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a really incredible field. Um, and something that you mentioned uh, going out into these spaces like science centers and learning spaces and museums, um, that's something that I would love to talk about, too. Like the reconnection and exploration piece of biomimicry is kind of like a really great entryway um, going out into, like you mentioned, kind of being in nature when you were um, you know, young and then getting inspired by organisms or being in a certain ecosystem and getting really excited about it often is a, a really good doorway for people to get introduced to biomimicry. Um, I'd love for you to kind of talk about the reconnection piece and like, what's a really, what's one of your favorite ways to reconnect with nature where you are? Well, where I am, I live on the North sea and one of my favorites uh, one of the, my favorite places to go is to the beach. Mm -hmm. I, I used to live on the east coast of uh, America, so uh, uh, Massachusetts from Massachusetts to North Carolina to Florida, I would always be the happiest barefoot on the beach. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot to find and to reconnect with at the beach. Uh, when I when I go there, I find sea urchins. I found some more shark egg sacs and oh, cool. uh, ray egg sacs and uh, you know, I, I go there every week to collect things. My work office room space is all these jars filled with the stuff that I, <laughs> that I find. Cause I have a space I, know, like I guess, too. <laughs> I guess, I guess that's my happy place to have all these, these things from nature around me and yeah. as inspiring. And so that's one of the places I like to go to, but also to take, it's also quite rainy and cold here. So sometimes it's, uh, if you're going to take a group somewhere, then it's nice to go to our hu huge and the oldest botanical, I think it's the oldest botan botanical gardens in the world. Oh, it's called Hortus Botanicus in also in Leiden. And so our excursions will be to, uh, to that botanical gardens where you can see all kinds of cool uh, cactuses and 
uh, plants that aren't really cactuses but look like cactuses mm -hmm. and and uh, go into their greenhouses and see the different uh, different plants there and they even have some different animals there I've got some walking leaves and walking sticks and oh cool just, uh, yeah butterflies. I love botanical gardens the one in Denver here has this huge conservatory which is amazing because it's so cold for much of the year so yeah you yeah. can go into this conservatory and it's like a rainforest and you can learn what's oh plants perfect there. And yeah it's such a cool space so you know what i mean then yeah so when it's cold outside and you you need to or you want to be able to sit and draw for a while or just mm -hmm. observe then you can you can do that there but it's also kind of cool to face the elements sometimes yep. too so so that's also okay it's it's about finding your green spaces and you know i i always encourage everybody to go outside and walk every day no matter what you do or where you are go outside and walk yeah. every day and try to find those pockets if you live in a city look for the the pocket parks and if you if you live in the country you know you've got lots of places to go <laughs> to, yeah. but you know find those nature spaces and you know there's nature in every sidewalk in every crack you can yep. find how the moss and the and the wild geraniums are growing outside and and observe the the patterns you know one of the patterns that i noticed here when i go outside just in my own garden is that a whole lot of plants have this fuzz on it and a geranium mm -hmm. will have the fuzz on it the the wisteria will have the fuzz mm -hmm. on it so you know i'm like how how can this be and why is this why is this important yeah and why is what are the 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 things that are helping this plant survive and what can we learn from that? So because of biomimicry, it's taught me to, you know, get a microscope or a magnifying glass and get mm -hmm. down and look and see, wow, this is a lot more there than I ever imagined. Yeah. I love bringing a jeweler's loop along and having the microscope at home to come back to is really interesting just to have like different perspectives on what's out there because yeah, it's so easy to even if you're just kind of walking down the street to walk past this incredible world beneath our feet um, and like moss and lichen, I'm obsessed with lichen and fungus. Oh yeah. Right now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I, we go to, we go to Scotland quite often to the Isle of Skye and there's this one place where they've got a lighthouse and there's this pattern of lichen that I, I take a picture of it every time I'm there and it hardly changes, but it's just the colors are so amazing. Yeah. Lichen is, is not <laughs> so incredible. We can learn a lot about our building, uh, our ways of building by looking at lichen. Yeah, yeah. Lichen has a lot to offer and is often very overlooked just because, yeah, it's so unassuming. <laughs> yeah. Unless exactly. it's like a bright orange color, bright green color. Yeah. But. Awesome. Well, we're going to, I have one more question for you. And this is, I think, um, a really good question because this kind of episode is focused on education and introducing folks to potentially some ways they can get involved. So one, um, one really great way to start getting um, knowledge in biomimicry is reading. And so I'd love to hear some of your favorite books or maybe just a few book recommendations and maybe just a, like a resource or two for where people could start and to get excited about biomimicry and learn about the natural world? Well, that's a really easy question because <laughs> the, the, the first book that pops right into my mind is the eyesight's book from Aaron Ravallo. Yeah. Uh, it's the nature journaling for biomimicry. And one of the really nice things about it, besides that it really feels nice on the outside and has ginkgo leaves right on the, mm -hmm. on the inside is that, you can jump right into the learning. It it says what is an eyesight, and that's an observation uh, exercise, and exactly how you can prepare and how you can start doing it. It's got the life's principles in there. It's got the taxonomy of how you can think about the functions in nature. So I would say if I were to buy one book, you know, of course you should have all your, your biomimicry and architecture. If you're an architect, you should have <laughs> biomimicry, innovation inspired by nature, uh, or, or self-organization and biological systems, or ca cat's paws and catapults if you're an engineer. 
you know, all kinds of books will help you uh, get attached and learn more how you can apply biomimicry. But this one book, The Eyesights, is just like in a nutshell how you can start out Mm -hmm. learning biomimicry. Uh, Yeah, I love that book. I actually just gifted somebody for the holidays that book. Um, because I love it so much and it is such a great entry point. Um, and something that I actually would, I was thinking about talking about too, is this idea of a nature journal, um, which is a really important tool. If you get excited about going on your little walks or going out into wild spaces, or even just around the corner to find that green spot, having a journal to observe and record is a really good practice to start to build in for biomimicry. And the eyesight's journal is a wonderful starting point for that. Yeah, yeah, and if you don't have one of those dummy books, one of the books with no lines in it, your your journal book that you can draw in, you need to get one. Yeah, uh, that's why I would to suggest to yeah to any any uh, listener because you can start to draw, and anyone who thinks I can't draw, they're wrong. You can draw exactly, and, and it's just about not being afraid. You know, I was always afraid to draw because I went to architectural school in Delft <laughs> here here in the Netherlands. And, you know, all the kids were above me in their drawing skills because they had already had two years. I jumped right into the third year because mm. I had studied in, in uh, University of Florida. So when I came here, they had all had these wonderful drawing lessons. And, you know, I was kind of intimidated by that. Yeah. And so with the eyesight's um semester that we had at ASU I started drawing again because we had to do that for our exercises and we had to hand it in and they're beautiful yeah. if I don't say so myself you, you have they wonderful are, drawings they're they're beautiful and you know it I can show them to my students and they say yeah but you know you're an architect said, no <laughs> it's not that it's because I practice and if you practice you improve and exactly. you you learn how to layer it and and really uh, address the important things that are necessary to to see to and learn that's the, how to see the nice thing about the nature journal too because it's just for you at least at the beginning so nobody else is yeah. seeing it um, everybody is an artist and so just getting opening the page and starting a drawing and then doing that repeatedly makes such a difference and drawing and artistry in general and and diagramming is so crucial to understanding the natural world and biology. So really great advice with nature journaling and eyesight. I totally agree. Yeah. We have a whole chapter of that in my thesis. um, Cause I had some co-authors, Asha and Michelle and Deb were co-authors on that chapter. We really were able to prove that there was such a huge difference just by drawing that yeah. the, the students internalized the mechanism so much better just by drawing by hand. So, you know, this is a crucial book just, just to get you to help you get started drawing I think that's uh, why I like this one so much. Yeah, totally. And I'd love to, I'm going to link eyesights um, so people can find it. And I'd also love to link your, your thesis if it's still online available somewhere. I yeah, it's always going to gonna be online. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. I have it somewhere as a PDF, but I'm wondering if it lives online and if you can send me the link for yes. that, I will link it to this yeah. podcast as well. I'll do that right away. Wonderful. Those are all the questions I have. Thank you, Laura, so much for chatting with me today. I had a blast. I did too. I I always like talking about biomimicry. Thanks, Lily. Agreed. Yes, onward and upward. Have a lovely rest of your day. You too. Thanks for joining us today. And stay tuned for next month's interview with a leader in the biomimicry and biophilic design space as we discuss what it takes to make biomimicry design ideas a reality and the importance of nature in our lives. Until then... Stay curious and spend some time outside.